Okay, so we were looking into the design of uh, some of the handcrafted features, and uh, we saw uh, three features already. Um, the first one was uh, the topicality. The second one uh, was about uh, the search engine result. And the third one was about like uh, whether the account is verified or not. Now, the next one is the sentiment score. So basically, Chinese sentiment Chinese sentiment was extracted using a toolkit called NLPIR. Okay. This is available uh, like uh, dictionary in order to extract Chinese sentiments and the authors used this um, to like um, uh, OK, so basically um, there are uh, so I'm just a bit mistaken. So uh, the NLPIR tool actually does uh, segmentation. Of the Chinese words. So as you understand that uh, uh, like uh, Chinese words do not have a natural word boundary, so therefore a segmentation is required. And this NLP IR tool actually does the uh, segmentation. And then they used uh, um, like a combination of a few dictionaries or a few sentiment lexicons. Uh, the most important one being the Hownet, okay, sentiment lexicon. To extract sentiment words. OK. So the sentiment score. Is defined as. where NPI is the number of positive sentiment words and NNI is the number of negative sentiment words okay in the message MI, okay? And mod MI is the number of words in the message MI, okay? And in is the Total number of reposts reposts, total number of reposts. of the message. OK, so this is how the sentiment score of the different reposts for the message posted for the original message posted is computed. OK. So you have a given root message 
and you are finding out the overall sentiment of all the reposts toward that root message okay using the above sentiment score metric okay similarly they computed the average doubt average surprise and average emotion in the reposts toward the root message. Now each of this actually was done with the help of a doubt lexicon which the authors built a surprise that means doubt word lexicon surprise word lexicon and an emotion word lexicon so in each case they found the number of uh, like words expressing doubts and non doubts expressing surprise and non surprise expressing uh, emotion and so expressing positive emotion and negative emotion okay so these are the three things that they used uh, in addition to the sentiment score okay as features now here we will get back to the computation of the agreement score okay and the doubt score that was used as age features if you recall okay so now here the agreement score a is computed as or agreement or whatever approval score is computed again as where npj are the number of approval words in nj are the number of these approval words so they built a lexicon of approval and disapproval words okay so a is the difference of the number of approval and the disapproval words in the message mj okay in the message mj that is posted in response to some root message okay so we wanted to if you recall we wanted to understand the level of approval that is there in a message okay in a reposted message for the original message so that is captured by this approval score so on each edge you compute the approval score in this way using the approval disapproval lexicon 
The doubt score, on the other hand, is again NPJ, NNJ by MJ, but here NPJ is the number of doubt words nnj is the number of non doubt words and again the lexicon comprising doubt and non doubt words right so in this way they computed the approval score or the agreement score whatever you call it and the doubt score now one of you asked me that why d is not simply 1 minus a in the first lecture that i was uh, when i was discussing about the doubt and the approval score i remember one of you asked me this are you here is that person here today somebody asked me this question on that day anyway yes sir so I, the, I did yeah so the answer is that you see the computation of a and d are lexicon based they are word based okay so basically depending on the dictionary of the approval and disapproval words and uh, the doubt and the non doubt words uh, this computation is done and so since it is in the language space it might not be a complement a direct complement of one another do, do do you are you in sync with me so do you get this so yes. that's why they did not use a like one minus thing hmm. Am I making sense? Yes, sir. Yeah, so basically they had two distinct lexicons and it's not that one lexicon is kind of a complement of the other. So therefore you cannot come jump to the conclusion that D is equal to one minus A or something. Okay, so that's why they did not, uh, uh, they had to use these two different measures. Okay, another important feature that they used was the repost time. As we already said that the posts that, uh, that the reposts that were made like uh, sooner uh, had a more intense effect. So that is something that the authors also uh, included as a feature. Like in addition to computing the damping factor, they also used it as a direct feature and this is defined as where ti is the time of the repost of a message. MI, okay, and T0 is the time of post of the original or the root message. Okay, so these are some of the important features. So, they, as I said, they used a bunch of 23 features. So, we will quickly look into uh, what these are, not spending much time on it because these are like uh, easy to get through. The ones that were a bit complex, we have already discussed uh, in details. So these are kind of the different um, features that they used. And as I say, they had it divided into three parts. The features extracted from the message, the features extracted from the user and the features extracted from the repost 
of the original post. So in the message, they had asked like if, if the uh, message has multimedia, if it has sentiment, some sort of sentiment score, I mean, uh, non-zero sentiment score, has a URL, what is the time span, uh, then what is the topic, what is the search engine feature. So these two we have already discussed in detail. Others are like uh, well understood um, and uh, the client is basically uh, whether uh, it was posted uh, from like uh, a mobile device or like um, a desktop platform or something like that. Okay. So in the user, uh, like there are quite a few features, but these are again uh, easy to understand, like whether the user is verified or not, has a description, whether we have, what is the gender, location, number of followers, friends, a number of messages posted, the time at which the user registered uh, into the platform and the different user types that we had discussed last day. So, if you recall, there are 12 user types. Okay, so uh, that was used as a feature. One of these uh, would like uh, be the type of the of a particular user, and that was used as a feature. Similarly, for the reposts, like you have the number of comments, number of reposts, the average sentiment uh, uh, of the reposts, average doubt, average uh, surprise, uh, average emotion, uh, and the repost time score. OK, so these all these things we have like more or less discussed in details. So these are the total set of features that the authors used in addition to the uh, propagation tree kernel. OK, so now they have these two sets of things. And as I said, that one needs to somehow combine these two set of features. OK, so on one side you had the you have the random walk kernel. And on the other side, you have the handcrafted features. Now you have to somehow merge them. OK, so. They used a traditional SVN framework to uh, do their predictions. So basically, if you recall in any standard supervised machine learning framework, you will have a feature vector with a set of labels associated with it. OK, so now here. In our case, X I is a 23 dimensional. Feature. Vector. Right. It's a 23 dimensional feature vector in our case. OK. And. In general, the if you use an RBF kernel. Then. The kernel function. Expressing the similarity between two features. Is denoted as by xi dot by xj. So where phi is a higher dimensional transformation of the features xi and xj. OK, and dot is the inner product. Now the question is to this, how do we integrate to this RBF kernel? How do we integrate the random walk kernel? So if you recall the random walk kernel. Was 
expressed by k cross t comma t prime which showed the extent of similarity between the two propagation trees okay and we normalize this kernel by the total number of nodes okay so therefore the final kernel is just a normalized version of k cross t comma t okay so now the integrated kernel for training the svm is given by beta where ti and tj are the two propagation trees corresponding to the two root messages mi and mj plus 1 minus beta okay so this is how we combine the two kernels one is the random walk kernel and the other is the feature vector kernel and we make a linear combination of these two and control the combination using the parameter beta okay so now using this formulation the authors went on to do some experiments in order to show the efficacy of their method okay so the authors managed to collect around 11k messages which was which were reported as false rumors by the sina webo moderation platform so they have a management center which assigns like uh, a flag with a message uh, if that message is found to be a false rumor okay so now they collected this data set in the time period 20 may 2012 to april 2014 within this time period they had this 11k posts however not many of these posts actually had a large number of reposts so the authors put a constraint that in order to do a meaningful experimentation the authors put a constraint that the the posts each of these posts should have at least 100 reposts okay so they made it a point that each of these posts should have at least 100 reposts now this actually drastically reduced the number of candidates and it landed up to Two six zero one. 
However, among these 2601, there were some posts for which the number of reposts was like really huge. Okay, so now in order to like identify true news, there is no easy way. Okay, and there is an additional problem that, uh, you know, the number of false rumors is much smaller than the total number of true news that permeates into the Sina Webu platform. In fact, the authors say that this ratio is one is to nine. So for every nine true news, okay, you have just one false news. So this is a highly disproportionate um, like uh, set. And uh, therefore, like you can very well uh, understand that if you design uh, like a vanilla classifier, then in 90% of the times, uh, the classifier is going to tell that the news is a true news, like irrespective of the uh, fact that it might be a false rumor. Okay, so therefore, the authors say that uh, this is a difficult task, so we go for a one is to one ratio. Although this is a very questionable thing to me, um, because like uh, what? So even though uh, one can train the data on uh, on an equal split uh, of uh, the positive and the negative class, but the test data should be of like uh, a split uh, which like conforms to something like one is to nine. So. Uh, this is something that was uh, a bit bothersome about the paper, but then like uh, the authors uh, did not show results for uh, this kind of a test split. So both their training and the test splits uh, had like equal number of almost equal number of false and true uh, messages. So for this, uh, what they did was in order to gather the true news, what they did was they went on to like have some 5k random messages okay from this random messages they actually identify those messages that have 100 reposts greater than or equal to 100 reposts like that of the false rumors. So, and then after that, they also manually checked whether the residual items have any false rumor. Or not. After doing this manual check and this constraint, passing it through this constraint and a follow up manual check, the authors finally landed up into 2536 news items. Okay. So now they have basically, so they are, they are. Data is more or less class balanced. False is 2601 and true is 2536. Now they divide the data into two types of data, one which they call the weak data and the other which they call the small data. So this is a bit like a non-standard way of doing experimentations. One usually has a validation data um, like uh, uh, which is referred to as the small data here. So here they have 500 false and 500 true. Items from which 
using which they learn the most important hyperparameters. of the model and the big data is the full data set on which they show their final result. So now tell me from whatever we have learned so far in this uh, paper. So what are the most important hyperparameters that you would need to know the values of? Clue is that there are at least two. One we have just now introduced. No idea. What are the parameters, important parameters of the model? Okay, what parameters have we introduced? Tell me. should be fairly easy. OK, let me go back. What is this? What is this beta? Is this a parameter or not? Well, this is one of the hyperparameters. Of the system. The other parameter. The other important parameter. So this is beta. So if there is beta, there should be some alpha. What was that alpha? Just a funny thing to note eh, that if there is a beta parameter, there must be an alpha parameter somewhere lying. What was that alpha? Do you remember? So in the opinion leader, uh, yes, we have a alpha. opinion leader. So basically, that's the second thing. So basically, the uh, There are two hyperparameters in the system that they are interested to know about. One is alpha and the other one is beta. Now, how do you estimate this? So these two estimations are done using the small data set. This is kind of the validation data set. Now, for estimating the uh, best value of alpha, what the authors did was the following. Okay, they set beta. So you cannot, you know, uh, like go on varying both the things together. So you have to fix one and try to find out the other one. So here they set beta equals to one. What does that mean? What only does that mean? Huh? Only random walk kernel. Only the graph kernel is being used.
because you see there is also a reason behind this because the alpha parameter is only valid for the graph kernel the nodes which are opinion leaders actually are part of the graph kernel okay it has nothing to do it has nothing to do with the uh, handcrafted feature vectors okay so that's why we close off that direction and we only use the graph kernel to estimate the value of the best value of alpha now the authors started varying the value of alpha and at each point they reported the accuracy value okay. so uh, so and uh, also they plotted the graph size versus the value of alpha okay and what they observe is that at an alpha of around 20 they achieve the maximum accuracy okay and therefore they set alpha to 20 okay so you see if you if you go alpha go in this direction this is alpha and this is the accuracy and you see that after setting after like a point where alpha is roughly equals to 20 the accuracy actually drops okay so therefore they set alpha to be 20 because that is kind of giving the maximum accuracy and at that point like wherever alpha is 20 the size of the graph is also not very big like i think it would be somewhere close to this okay which is kind of manageable like 100 nodes or 100 to 200 nodes okay so now that was about alpha similarly they had to identify beta so what did they do for this now again they varied beta and estimated the accuracy okay here the alpha was fixed to 20 they just varied beta between 0 to 1 and tried to estimate the best accuracy value and what they observed is that at around beta equals 0.6 they get the best accuracy so therefore from this two set of experiments they got alpha to 20 and beta 2.6 now with this set of values they went on to do their experiments on the larger data set and for the larger data set this is their model the hybrid model which uses both the uh, graph kernel as well as the feature vector kernel and they compared it with some of the competing baselines one from Castillo et al and the other from Young et al uh, both None of these, actually, none of these uh, methods use uh, propagation kernels or propagation trees. They use some of the repost features, but uh, so the Castillo model use some of the repost features, but then uh, like um, none of these, they use the graph kernel uh, idea. And they also saw like what is the performance by just using the graph kernel that is here beta is equal to one. Okay. In such a scenario, what they observe is that the results using just the graph kernel is as good as the results reported in Young. So you see like results are in fact, uh, so in some cases slightly better. So some of the uh, values of precision recall are better. So basically if is the false uh, part and uh, O is the uh, correct part. Okay, so they uh, show the class-wise precision and recall, um, as well as the class-wise F1 score. Uh, this is a very honest way of showing the results uh, because sometimes, like when you show the uh, total value, uh, it might be dominated by one of the uh, classes, and therefore we don't get a very clear picture. But here, the authors seem to have a very good uh, performance on 
all the uh, different metrics. Only point of concern was this idea of a balanced uh, test set. Uh, it remains to exploration as to uh, what would happen if they would have had an unbalanced uh, test set. So, uh, so, so that is uh, like kind of uh, more or less the uh, overall results uh, that the authors uh, wanted to show. Uh, okay. And they also uh, used some simple graph features okay, to examine like how uh, Castillo's uh, method compares. So uh, if you use the simple graph features, not so from the propagation tree, if you just use the simple graph features, uh, not the propagation tree, then also the results are not as good as using the propagation tree structure. OK, so therefore, like uh, they posit that the propagation tree structure is a much better idea than just simply using some of the graph features. So now after this, like as usual, they also went to some ablation study and uh, they tried to see uh, the importance of each of the features. OK, so here a minus indicates that this particular feature is dropped while all the other features are present. This particular feature is dropped. So minus topic type means the topic type feature is dropped. Minus search engine means the search engine feature is dropped. Now, looking at this table, can you quickly comment on some important observations? So of course we see that all the features taken together does the best. Anything else? The new features and graph kernel are particularly important. Very good. So uh, if you remove just the graph kernel feature, you see that causes the uh, that causes a drop in the uh, accuracy, which is largest while removing like any single feature, single type feature. So if you remove topic type, search engine, user type, any one of this among these like so these are all single type features all new features are like a mixture of features okay so uh, or say all new features and graph kernel these are all mixture of features but graph kernel you can consider to be a single type feature so dropping the graph kernel only actually causes the largest drop in the accuracy which shows the importance of the use of graph kernels OK, so that is one thing that the authors tried to stress using this ablation study. In among the other type of features that they constructed, it seems that the topic type feature is quite important. So this is the second second best. Or the second highest drop in accuracy uh, is uh, witnessed when you remove the topic type feature. So these are some of the interesting observations that the authors made from the ablation study. Now, uh, like as we had been telling from the very beginning that detecting fake news or uh, false rumors at its very early stage is very important. OK, so uh, detecting it late might uh, do all the harm it could have done and therefore detecting it late is not a very good choice. So the authors went on one step further to study what is the like overall uh, performance of their model if they try to detect um, it early on. So how much early? So the authors say that, uh, OK, let us investigate the. Zero to 24 hours. 
fine so this is kind of the most crucial period so the first day the day of the post like starting from the 0 hours to 24 hours so at 0 hour what will be our graph kernel feature What will be this at zero hours? This is very easy. So at zero hours, are there any reposts possible? No. Okay, so, uh, so at the zeroth hour, the number of reposts is like tending to zero. So therefore, the nodes in the propagation tree are zero, right? So at this point, the graph kernel input is close to empty. Okay. Now, as time progresses, the graph becomes richer and richer. Okay, and the authors looked in with interest in the first 24 hours and the results are shown in this particular figure. Okay. So on the X axis, you have the detection deadline. That is the point at which you are detecting uh, something as a false rumor. And on the Y axis is the accuracy value. And what do you see? So, and the authors are actually comparing their results with the other two uh, baselines. Okay, so this is young. This is Castillo. And this is hybrid. That is their model. So what do you see? Tell me what is happening in the early hours. I mean, very early hours. All are bad. Okay. All are bad. Then, after like around five hours or so, four to five hours or so, the models pick up. Okay, the models pick up. And by the time it is around 24 hours, the author's model actually goes to somewhere around 0 0.87, 0 0.88 accuracy. Okay, and this is far better than the other two models. And in fact, Castillo is better than Young because as I said, Castillo is using some of the repost features and some simple graph features like uh, which allows them to uh, have some semi information that is like, uh, um, I mean, that is uh, uh, there in the propagation trees that the authors have built. So some of the goodness of those propagation trees are actually getting fused into the Castillo's model uh, because they are using some very simple features, repost features. However, it is not as good as using the random walk kernel that the authors have used. And by the time, so, okay, initially uh, the authors seem to be doing quite poorly because it is understandable 
that they do not have much repost data, but by the time it's like four hours, they pick up well. And like, in fact, like within five hours of time, the accuracy is more than 80%. And by the time it's 24 hours, you can say with almost, almost close to 90% accuracy whether something is a false rumor or not. So that uh, shows their, if the efficacy of their model, even like at the early hours uh, of propagation of a news item. Okay, so we will stop here. So with this, we finish uh, of the uh, fake news part of uh, content governance. And next week, like in one or one and a half uh, classes, we will uh, cover hate speech and then we will start media bias next week itself. Because tomorrow is a holiday, otherwise we could have started tomorrow itself. Uh, so next week will be that, and the last week uh, of the course, I guess, will be uh, last. I, I don't, uh, I'm not exactly counting properly, probably. Uh, la last or the semi last week will be uh, on explainability, uh, and then finally we will talk a little bit about the moral mission experiment, and we'll finish with that. Okay, so it's up here. Uh, any questions?